Welcome to Capital Considerations, the podcast that takes complex ideas from the investment world and makes them accessible to everyone. I'm your host, Tony Roth, Chief Investment Officer of Wilmington Trust. It will be hard to overstate how large the Federal Reserve looms in investors' minds or its influence on financial markets. In context of the current crisis, the Fed has received universal praise for its quick and decisive action. It's focused on ensuring market liquidity and keeping capital flowing as much as possible to assist borrowers. And it's achieved these ends in a variety of ways that include rate policy, lending programs, open market purchases of both federal and corporate debt. And last, what we're going to focus on today and our next episode is through its words, its messaging, its efforts to directly influence future expectations of both policy rates and inflation. To help determine the latest messaging in regards to its recently announced sweeping changes, we are very fortunate to have with us Charles Plosser, the former president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. He was at the helm of the Philadelphia Fed from 2006 to 2015, which of course includes the great financial crisis, three rounds of quantitative easing, and other Fed policies that still reverberate today. And most importantly, for anyone who works for Wilmington Trust and m and he taught economics to our chief executive officer, Renee Jones, at the University of Rochester in their MBA program. Charles, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tony. It's good to be with you. Charles, we want to talk about the recent changes made by the Fed, but it's important to understand them in a broader context. So to set the stage in understanding the Fed's new long-term policy, which is its first major change to its 2012 statement, let's take a look at some of the background. Can you share the history with us, please, around the so-called 2012 statement, which is when the first laid out its dual-purpose mandate? 2012 was a was a watershed for the Fed. Uh, prior to that, its policies and strategies and tools had been largely obscure to the public and to the markets. And its goals were very vague. And transparency was a problem, although transparency had been, had been improving, you know, for many years at a gradual pace. The importance of the 2012 statement it did two things that it had never done before. They did them in the name of both transparency and, uh, communication and credibility. Those two things that it established an inflation target of 2%. In other words, it interpreted its mandates from Congress that a 2% inflation rate was equivalent to or associated from their sense with uh, stable prices. Of course, 2% inflation is not stable prices, but it established the Fed's interpretation of what they thought stable prices means to them and what they wanted to achieve in terms of inflation. They also said in that statement that the unemployment rate, our maximum employment, which is the way the mandates uh, expressed, is something that you don't observe directly. It's influenced by lots of things that are beyond the Fed's control. And therefore, because it was both variable and affected by so many different things, from taxes to regulations to productivity to demographics, that the Fed would not and could not reasonably set a numerical target for the employment side of their mandate. So establish those two things, and that was a very important step forward for the Fed. And one of the last banks, central banks in the world, to actually enumerate an inflation target. I've had a chance to to read a number of your papers that you've published back from that period. And one of the things that you talk a lot about is the importance of the articulation of those strategies, if you will, around both the labor market and inflation in helping guide its actions. And that when the Fed takes an action, that it has to relate to advancing those strategies. Can you just explain for the listeners why that's so important in your mind? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons. One is that um, uncertainty about the path and the conduct of monetary policy is important to markets and it's important to the public. Establishing expectations of inflation or actions by the Fed uh, is important. Otherwise, with lots of uncertainty, 
looming about what the Fed's next actions may or may not be uh, creates uncertainty in the marketplace, can create volatility, can lead to mistakes in the marketplace if the Fed does something unexpected. I think that it's really about communications. It's trying to make policy, if not automatic, at least more predictable. And so we often describe it as trying to articulate or put forward a reaction function. That is, the Fed will do X if Y happens. And so trying to communicate to the public somewhat more about its reaction function was what it was trying to do and what it should continue to try to do. So, for example, the statement about inflation said that if inflation were running above 2%, it would be seeking to try to get inflation back to 2%. If inflation were running below 2%, it would seek to get inflation back to 2%. So it was fairly symmetric in its efforts to to, uh, to articulate at least the strategy, if not always the tactics that it would take to do that. And that was important because it anchored inflation expectations near 2%, and that was an important and fundamental issue for the Fed. Okay, and we'll talk a bit more about inflation versus inflation expectations in a few moments, but let's just talk a bit about what happened a few weeks ago when the Fed announced a change to the 2012 statement, both with respect to how it's going to target inflation and how it's going to take into account dynamics of the labor market into its deliberations. And I must say that when I consider the success of the Fed in the current crisis, I would give the Fed overall fairly high marks. The Fed acted in a very decisive way. It brought the policy rate essentially down to zero very quickly, added a lot of liquidity into the system and ensured that we did not have a financial crisis. But I am a bit puzzled that the most recent changes to the policy philosophy or approach, not just from a, if you will, formal perspective, but also some of the messaging around what they've conveyed. Because the messaging from a market standpoint has been that the policy rate is going to stay what I would describe as nailed to the floor until 2023. And I find it very puzzling that they feel that they can know what's going to happen over the next three years. They could be so confident that the policy rate will stay where it is. Having said that, let's talk about what the actual change was. So they've introduced this concept of average inflation targeting, where they are seeking to not always bring the inflation rate back to 2% immediately, but to achieve an average of 2% over a longer period of time. Because we've seen such low inflation over the last decade, quite interestingly, they've not been able to get the inflation rate to 2%. They are now supposing that they will allow inflation to run meaningfully higher than 2%, so that over time, you have an average of 2%. And it raises a number of questions. I guess the first question would be, if they haven't been able to get inflation to 2% anyway, what's the point of even trying to pivot in this way towards a chronological averaging if they can't get to 2% in the first place? I think this revised statement is both ambitious it's a much more complicated strategy than they have articulated in the past. It has generated some confusion. So I have my doubts that this is an improvement of any kind and may actually be problematic for a variety of reasons. And one of, the, one of those reasons you just mentioned, which is if they're worried that inflation expectations are declining or inflation's been too low when they've had a 2% target, they're not going to solve that problem by just now announcing that they're, well, their target's actually going to be higher than 2%. Why didn't inflation go to 2% after interest rates being near zero for almost eight years? Trillions of dollars of quantitative easing and asset purchases. Why didn't inflation go up? That's the elephant in the room. And that's the big question, I think. And the Fed really hasn't addressed that question. They just said, oh, our new goal is higher than 2%, at least for in the, in the near term. So unless they tell you the public and the market something about, well, how do they expect to do that or what went wrong before, uh, they've got a big hole in this strategy as far as I'm concerned that is not very compelling. And I don't know that it makes them, I'm not sure this makes them any more credible than they were before. 
The other problem they have with this strategy is that they talk a lot about making up for shortfalls in inflation. That is, if inflation's running below 2%, they'll run it above 2% in order to move the average inflation rate up closer to 2%. But they explicitly, implicitly and explicitly in speeches by Powell and, and Vice Chair Clarida have said that they're not going to offset overshoots. If inflation runs too high for a while, they are not going to aim to bring inflation, average inflation down by running inflation rate below 2%. Well, why is that? Well, they're not very clear about why that's true. And if you think about the concept of averaging, that's got to lead to an average inflation rate over time that's probably higher than 2%. Right, if, if they can produce inflation at all in the first place. <laughs> well, that's assuming they can produce the inflation in the first place. That's right. right. Even if they're successful at that, what, what makes them think that they can fine-tune it enough that they can really achieve average? Let me ask a question on that um, and, and try to take their side for a moment, which is to say that let's talk about inflation expectations. So our chief economist, Luke Tilley, who used to work for you at the Fed, has explained to me and enlightened me that most economists believe that inflation expectations if not the dominant force in actually determining where inflation is in the future, is one of the key forces in, in determining where inflation is. It's sort of a self-fulfilling phenomenon where somehow um, by believing inflation will be at a certain level, um, it actually turns out to be so. Um, it, I think it would be really helpful for our listeners if you could explain that. It's somewhat counterintuitive. And might it be the case that the Fed through that mechanism of inflation expectations is trying to produce the inflation through this policy of suggesting it'll allow inflation to run higher. It is true that inflation expectations, the Fed has come to believe, is one of the most significant factors that actually determine inflation. And the reason that's important and the reason it's different than it used to be is that economists used to rely on what they call the Phillips curve to be their model of inflation. And the Phillips curve was a relationship that the Fed ex tried to exploit for 40 years that said when unemployment rates were high, inflation would come down. And when the unemployment rates were low, inflation would, would go up. And in their statement of this new policy, they declared that that relationship isn't very effective in forecasting inflation. And even when unemployment was high over this recession, inflation stayed pretty well in the range of one and a half to two percent, whether the unemployment rate was high or low. Of course, some of your customers and clients may remember the 1970s when inflation was very, very high, but so was unemployment. So this relationship between unemployment and labor markets and inflation empirically has not been very powerful. So the Fed has to look for something else to explain inflation. And right now, the current popularity and current evidence suggests that inflationary expectations are what's important. And there's certainly some truth to that, but it's also kind of a cop-out because it doesn't say much about how those expectations are formed or what actually does cause inflation if it's not unemployment moving up and down. And the Fed hasn't answered that question. They want to get expectations up. But the real question there is you can't get expectations up unless the public and markets believe that you are credible in generating more inflation. So this is all about the Fed's credibility, believability, and commitment to being able to do that. And again, the missing link is they haven't explained to us how they're going to do that, or what they're going to do differently from the last 10 years that might have the hope of generating more inflation than we've got now. So in other words, yes, inflation expectations may be very important in terms of inflation. Yes. But you can't try to manipulate inflation expectations merely by directly going after expectations. You still need to talk about whether it be the labor market producing inflation or something else, you still need to aim at some fundamental mechanism that will impact expectations. You can't just go directly after the expectations themselves. 
expectation is not something they can just manipulate without delivering on something. Let's change the conversation then a bit and say that, and this goes to the question of credibility, I think, which you've mentioned is so important. So let's assume for the sake of, of this thought experiment that the Fed has us engaged in right now, that we do find ourselves by hook or by crook in a world where inflation has now arrived and it's over 2%. And it would seem to me that when the inflation gets to the point where it's over 2%, whether the Fed has the, the wherewithal and the fortitude to step back and allow it to run hotter is going to depend a lot on, on the nature of the inflation and what's causing it and what the overall conditions are. And no one can really say today whether or not the Fed will have the fortitude to allow it to run hotter for a long period of time or not, because we, won't, we don't know today what the conditions and circumstances are going to be. Is that a concern that you have around the Fed's credibility here in terms of what actually ends up happening? Yes, it makes their objective or their strategy here that much more difficult to articulate. And they haven't said much about what happens if inflation is too high. They've said they're not going to offset it. Well, what does that mean? If they're worried about expectations now being perhaps too low or worried about them falling, will they be worried when, let's say, they're running a two and a half or three percent inflation rate to offset the last 10 years of, in, of low inflation, that somehow inflation expectations begin to drift above 2%, what will they do? And how quickly will that happen? You would think that expectations would begin to rise. You might think that. And yield curve would begin to steepen. Expectations will rise further than the Fed wanted them to. Then what? So they're being very asymmetric in how they want to manage expectations. I call it trying to fine-tune expectations. And that's a really difficult task. I agree it's important, but trying to fine-tune expectations in this way or keep them controlled in this way is almost like a dog chasing its tail. So let's pivot now to a perspective of the investor because it's a little confusing for investors, and you mentioned that earlier, that it's been a bit confusing for, for some participants in the markets, is because when I think about the fact that the Fed controls the front end of the yield curve directly, which is the policy rate, but they don't directly control the rest of the yield curve, it seems to me that there's a bit of a paradox in what they're doing, which is that as they work to suggest that they're going to have higher inflation over time, it would seem to push inflation expectations up in some way. And that in turn would seem to have an upward force on the longer end of the yield curve. And so as they are pushing potentially the long bond up, it would seem to make it more difficult for them to do what they want to do right now, which is keep the policy rate very, very low because they're going to end up with a a much cheaper yield curve, which for a variety of reasons can be problematic. Is there a paradox in what they're trying to do in that way? Or how do you see that? A bit of a paradox. It's a puzzle that cuts two ways. One of the things that the Fed is worried about is what has become known as the effective lower bound, that once interest rates, policy rates, the Fed reaches zero, it's very hard for them to lower rates further if that's what they'd like to do. So one of the things that comes about when the Fed reaches this zero bound or this what they call effective lower bound, and they can't lower rates more, one of the, I'll call it theoretical arguments, is that it's very important then to counteract that fact is to have the expectations of inflation really rise so that market participants are confident that things will be better in the future and that will make them more confident about today. That's a way of offsetting, if you will, having expectations of inflation rise. If the policy rates bounded at zero, then actually the inflation adjusted real interest rate actually gets lower with more expected inflation. And so this is a how to deal with the zero bound. So in some sense, this is exactly what the Fed wants to have happen. But that only happens if the Fed is credible about delivering on this. If they're not credible, it doesn't work. So that's the downside question about why you want this for the downside. But what they haven't addressed is 
as we were just talking about, what happens on the upside? What happens when inflation actually gets above 2% and expectations might be drifting above 2%? What does this new framework say about that? It says nothing. So now, at the risk of being somewhat flippant, it sounds like this is a policy strategy that defines 2% as the floor for inflation in terms of the Fed's objectives. Right. And therein lies some of the confusion that you've already alluded to. Exactly. That's why all this is, I think, very confusing. So I think while there is some theory here that is at work, and I understand that theory, I think their articulation of it has been less than transparent and probably not clear enough to really do what they're trying to do. Now, maybe over time, this will become more apparent and they'll deliver more information. But right now, it's pretty vague. And so I'm not sure that I feel more comfortable or less comfortable about what the Fed's going to be doing in the future. And whenever Powell or Clarido or someone says, well, you know, the Fed will be flexible. Well, that just means they'll do what they want to do when they want to do it. So I think that while this is a very complicated strategy, it perhaps has some merits if it were to work perfectly. But because it's so complicated and the communication of it is complicated, at the end of the day, it may not deliver on what the Fed is expecting. They might find themselves later on, as you suggested, when inflation actually begins to creep up, and depending on what kind of inflation is, will find themselves hard-pressed to deliver on the promises that they've now made. Let me ask you one last question, Charles, because you've been in the room for these kinds of meetings. And as a market participant, one of the things that has been so important in understanding the rebound that we've seen in risk, risky assets, although the market seems to be a little bit weaker um, since the end of the summer, is that there's been a pervasive feeling that the Fed was going to be there as a backstop. Some people call it a Fed put. And it's been a little bit interesting that there has almost been, it feels like a causal relationship when the market goes down by a certain amount, there's more messaging from the Fed. Um, there's more of this whatever it takes type of mentality that seems to be emanating directly from the Fed. And, and really the question is, the Fed certainly does have more dry powder, particularly on the quantitative easing side. Um, its balance sheet really expanded greatly in the beginning of the summer, but it hasn't so much since then, which would imply that certainly the Fed could go out and buy more debt, whether it be of the U.S. or, or corporate debt now. What's your take on the notion of the Fed put? Do you think it's real and do you think that the Fed is really tuned into financial market levels such that when we start to see real stress in equity markets, as an example, the Fed is going to be meaningfully more apt to step in and, and use its dry powder? So I think that's a very complicated question. I hope there is not a Fed put. And I don't believe that the Fed and the FOMC, I mean, I attended some 70 FOMC meetings during my career, which is a lot. I don't believe the Fed consciously thinks of itself as providing a put to markets. That would be a very bad idea. That's not consciously what they do. However, having said that, I think their actions and their language around market volatility, whether it be in equity markets or bond markets or whether it be in very short term overnight trading at the funds market or repo market or other things like that. Their actions and their body language, if you will, certainly, I believe, has led markets to believe that that's what's going on. And I think that's a very dangerous message, even if it's just inadvertent, to be sending. And they need to be firmer about that, that that is not the levels of the stock market or bond market, or any other financial market, is not part of the Fed's mandate. It's about the economy as a whole. So I think the Fed has to be very careful about this. And uh, I argued many times during my time there that the language we were using was insinuating this, or at least leading the public to believe that, and we needed to be more careful. I don't think it's what they think they're doing, but 
the actual actions may be sending that signal, whether they like it or not. We've used the word empirical a few times today, and the empirical evidence may be somewhat different than the described intent. So, Charles, thank you so much for those insights. I am going to summarize quickly our three takeaways for today. I would start with the facts that the Fed has made some important changes to its long-term strategy, its official strategy, and they've left off some critical details yet to be worked out, is how I would describe it. And while I think that the intent of the policy is to make the Fed in a way more predictable um, and even add to its credibility, I think that it's yet to be seen whether that'll be the case. And critically, the Fed has sort of left out one of the key factors in predicting inflation, which is labor market dynamics, that it had explicitly used in the past. And we'll see what happens if it replaces it with something else. So that's the first takeaway. Second takeaway is that we think that the Fed is clearly trying to manage inflation expectations in a way to actually push inflation higher. But it hasn't explained how it's going to do that. What is the intervening mechanism to do that? If it's not successful in filling that gap, then the Fed is actually going to end up losing its hard-earned credibility that it's accomplished over the years. And then thirdly and, and last, I would say that the impact on the financial markets could be significant one way or the other, depending on whether the Fed is successful in this somewhat risky new approach. On the one hand, on the fixed income side, if they are successful in bringing up inflation, we would expect to see higher longer term rates and a steeper yield curve. And we'd expect this to happen sooner than later, even if it's truly until 2023, until the Fed starts to move its policy rate, we would expect the yield curve to certainly steepen before that time. Interestingly, since the late summer, our so-called forward-looking inflation rate for the five years starting in five years, we call that the five by five rate, is actually fallen by 40 basis points. So, so far, it doesn't seem to be working. For equities, if the Fed were successful in raising rates, then that would mean that the equity market might not have as much room to run in the longer term because higher rates are typically uh, disadvantageous for equities. However, as we've discussed, it's not clear the Fed will be successful in accomplishing this. So we'll have to just wait and see. With that, I want to thank our listeners for joining today and provide a special thanks to you, Charles, for being with us today. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. We are going to uh, fortunately continue our conversation in the next episode where we're going to again um, be talking to Charles and be exploring um, a lot of the ideas that Charles has posited over the years around what a different approach to running the Fed might look like, and also focus in on the Fed's communication and messaging practices and discuss whether or not the much greater volume of messaging that the Fed now provides relative to, say, the Greenspan era is a good thing or a bad thing. So please tune in for that episode. I want to thank our listeners for joining us, and I encourage you to visit WilmingtonTrust.com for a roundup of our investment and planning content. You can subscribe to Capital Considerations on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast channel to ensure you get updates on future episodes. Thank you again for listening. This podcast is for information purposes only and is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the sale of any financial product or service or recommendation or determination that any investment strategy is suitable for a specific investor. Investors should seek financial advice regarding the suitability of any investment strategy based on the investor's objectives, financial situation, and particular needs. The information on Wilmington Trust's capital considerations with Tony Roth has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but its accuracy and completeness are not guaranteed. The opinions, estimates, and projections constitute the judgment of Wilmington Trust as of the date of this podcast and are subject to change without notice. Wilmington Trust is not authorized to and does not provide legal or tax advice. Our advice and recommendations provided to you is illustrative only and subject to the opinions and advice of your own attorney, tax advisor, or other professional advisor. Diversification does not ensure a profit or guarantee against a loss. There is no assurance that any investment strategy will be successful. Past performance cannot guarantee future results. 
Investing involves a risk and you may incur a profit or a loss. Any reference to company names mentioned in the podcast should not be constructed as investment advice or investment recommendations of those companies. Facts and views presented in this report have not been reviewed by and may not reflect information known to professionals in other business areas of Woman Can Trust or m and Bank and may provide to seek to provide financial services to entities referred to in this report. m and Bank and Wilmington Trust have established information barriers between their various business groups. As a result, m and Bank and Wilmington Trust do not disclose certain client relationships or compensation received from such entities in their reports. Investment products are not insured by the FDIC or any other governmental agency, are not deposits of or other obligations of or guaranteed by Wilmington Trust, m and Bank, or any other bank or entity, and are subject to risk, including a possible loss of the principal amount invested. Wilmington Trust is a registered service mark used in connection with various fiduciary and non-fiduciary services offered by certain subsidiaries of m and Bank Corporation, including, but not limited to, Manufacturers and Traders Trust Company, m and Bank, Wilmington Trust Company, WTC, operating in Delaware only, Wilmington Trust NA, WTNA, Wilmington Trust Investment Advisors, Inc., WTIA, Wilmington Funds Management Corporation, WFMC, and Wilmington Trust Investment Management, LLC, WTIM. Such services include trustee, custodial agency, investment management, and other services. International corporate and institutional services are offered through m Bank Corporation's international subsidiaries. Loans, credit cards, retail and business deposits, and other business and personal banking services and products are offered by m and Bank, member FDIC. 2021 m and Bank Corporation and its subsidiaries, all rights reserved.